So discovery is, you know, trying to understand what their problems are, what their pains are. And so micro commitments is right out of the gates from the first time you talk to the person or you send them an email, you want to get a small commitment out of them. And because what happens is, is that most salespeople don't do that. And so our customers, they're conditioned to not commit to things. Welcome to another episode of the Big Picture Business Podcast. Thanks so much for being here with us. And guess what? Today, we have another very special guest that we cannot wait to talk with. His name is Eric Fisher, and Rory is actually going to tell you all about him right now. Go for it, Rory. Well, yeah, today, Eric Fisher is a client of ours who we launched his book recently. He is a sales expert. So we're going to be talking about different sales strategies, specifically with business-to-business sales. but let me introduce you, Eric. <laughs> so Eric is the, the CEO and founder of uh, Intelligent Sales Secrets Academy and a number one international bestselling author of The Intelligence Factor. And he's been featured on numerous media outlets, including Thrive Global and Disrupt and Yahoo Finance and ABC and NBC and Fox. And he's been selling for over 19 years and has sold over $40 million in sales just in the last seven years. And also, Eric's a, a husband and a father who has two children and he advocates for Down syndrome and other special needs communities. So Eric, always a pleasure. Welcome to the BPB podcast. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, happy you're here. Yeah, and, and actually this year, I, the, the numbers uh, are, are better now. So I've done 80 million actually as of this year in 12 years though. So, <laughs> right, because um, it's a year. <laughs> Very yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. So. Wow. Now, Eric, I really, I mean, I know, I know you and Rory, like you know each other pretty well. And so I'm excited just to, to get to know you like through this podcast along with our listeners. And so just right out of the gate, I want to know, how did you get started in sales? Like most salespeople do, which is you kind of fall into it. Sales has a, a super low barrier to entry. So I'm in professional sales. So I, I'm in business to business sales. Um, I'm not, you know, a closer or anything like that. And, and those are, those jobs are fine for, you know, B2C sales but in the professional markets, you know, in that sector, I mean, you need a college degree most of the time. Now, I think we don't really need to hire people that have college degrees most of the time. It's not really necessary. It's, I think for me, college taught me how to problem solve and, you know, figure things out. You know, you make a circle of friends. I have a few friends that, you know, I'm still friends with today over 15 years uh, later. But you know, I fell into sales because I knew I wanted to be in business. I knew I wanted to make a lot of money. My parents were educators. And so I knew that I had to do something that allowed me to dictate my own my own income. I can remember that we had a good life. I didn't, I was never short on anything. We we're never short on money, but we lived a frugal lifestyle. My parents saved and invested and, you know, I learned financial management from them. But one of the things I didn't like is, you know, I know, you know, I grew up in the Michael Jordan era, right? So I always wanted a fresh pair of J's to, you know, play basketball and kick around and I never got a pair. And that always bothered me. At the time I thought I was uncool because I didn't fit in because I didn't have, you know, I struggled a lot with being insecure but as I think about it, really, I, I thought, okay, if I can get into a job where I can make money and dictate how much money I make by my work ethic, that's the kind of job I want to be in. I just, growing up, I didn't know what that meant. I just knew that that's what I wanted. And so then when I was in college, I got involved in some entrepreneurial type things where I ran a painting business. I sold suits for a little while. I sold Cutco knives. I mean, I did everything. And um, I was actually pretty good at all of them, but I was very scared of rejection. So, you know, that taught me how to you know, knocking on doors, trying to sell painting services, which was a college internship, but you're running a business. Um, that was really hard. And I, I hated being rejected. I still, I still don't really like it. You just learn to deal with it. And then I, I had an opportunity. I thought, well, I'm going to become a, a marketer. But in college, when you learn marketing, you really don't know what marketing is. You think marketing is sales, which it's really not. It's a component of sales, but they don't really tell you, okay, you're going to get a marketing degree. What does that mean? They don't, that you don't know. And still to this day, I don't know if they actually tell people, like, do you become a director of marketing? Do you become a CMO? Like, I don't know if anybody actually tells these, tells college students this. So anyway, I ended up with a business administration degree and a lot of, you know, a lot of places, a higher entry level salespeople go to the big colleges and they recruit people. And so I was fortunate that I had a college or a former high school and college friend who was working at a large bank. And I got an interview with him when he was at our, we went to the same college together. He was down there recruiting people and he ended up hiring me and he actually became kind of my first role model in sales. Cool. Wow. Yeah. So. 
Well, what did what did you like most about sales once you got into it? The money was was a big part of it, <laughs> um, you know. But at first, there was no money. I talk a lot about it in my book. I was I was so broke, like most people are right out of college. But a lot of my friends were were not in sales. I was smart enough to rent uh, my first condo or apartment in after college was in downtown Chicago in the Gold Coast neighborhood. Which, if you know anything about Chicago, that's mm-hmm. one of the most expensive areas. Yes. Very nice. And um, yeah, it's very nice. Just saw a lot of celebrities every day, but way unaffordable. In fact, I rented that place from a guy that used to push me around in high school. He, I remember he used to slam my head into the locker. Oh, no. um, oh, oh. But, but I, he never ever went to college and he became a multimillionaire. He's a huge real estate tycoon in our hometown now. But, you know, he grew up and matured and he ended up renting this condo to me. It was an awesome condo, but I couldn't afford it. I mean, I remember at the time it was it's like three hundred and fifty or four hundred dollars a month just to park your car across the street, and when you're making thirty thousand dollars a year salary, which is like poverty basically, and that, that you know to live downtown, and I wasn't I was spending every cent I had on partying and doing all the stupid stuff that young men do when they're How'd right out do? of college. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, at first, it was kind of like I put myself in a really bad financial position. I mean, I had creditors chasing me for late credit card bills. I took care of all those things after I started making money, but I mean, it was embarrassing. Like it was really, really embarrassing. And I, I was kind of in a bad spot. I remember having a heart to heart with myself because my parents were, were disappointed in me. And I just remember saying to myself, I got to get out of this. And because it was, I was kind of headed to, to no man's land. And a lot of my friends that were not in sales had kind of like cushier jobs. So like they could go out comfortably. They were making like $60,000 a year. So they weren't broke. They were probably better with money than I was not, you know, spending money on stupid things. And so they could go out and I just remember having a lot of envy. And I said, you know, the only way out of this is not to save, even though I learned to save, of course, but it was, I just need to earn more. And so what I liked is I just mirrored my my boss at the time who came from a blue collar family, frankly, but he was the the one professional out of the, they got into professional, the professional world out of his, his brothers. And he was the middle brother. And he just had a work ethic that was just something I'd never seen before. He was just meticulous about, you know, first one, a lot of the old school sales stuff, first one in the office, packed his own lunch every day, never got up from his chair, just made phone calls all day, very, you know, dressed very professionally. He was a good looking guy. You know, he actually, he mar- ended up marrying the girl he was dating, um, which I think he, they met in, in college, I believe. But I just did everything he did. And what do you know? It worked. It worked. So, <laughs> yeah. talk, talk about a solid mentor. Yeah, he was, he was a really good mentor. Awesome. So once you, you know, were doing all of that and you started seeing some success, you started developing your own sales process, so that things that you realized started working and not working, correct? And that's what eventually turned into uh, your book, which we worked on called The Intelligence Factor. So what I'm wondering is, uh, what is sales positioning through intelligence? What does that intelligence factor look like? That job was, was B2C sales because we were selling mortgages. And so I got out of that job during the financial crisis because there was just some things I wasn't really comfortable with. And I left on a, on a high note. You know, I, I was making good money. I, sales numbers were, were some of the best in the country. But then I, want, I knew I wanted to get into business-to-business sales because it's a much more complex sell. Sales cycles are longer. The deal sizes are much bigger. So when deal sizes are bigger, you can earn more, right? But it involves more strategic thinking. It's not, you know, talking to somebody one time or a couple times and then you close them. It's a lot more, I mean, you have to strategize. How do I get in front of a C-level executive and all the director VPs and directors underneath them and all the, the, the senior managers underneath them and, you know, really like mapping out who owns what that would fall within your product or service. And so when I got into B2B sales, I was fortunate. I'm still an employee of, of the company. I've been there for, for 12 years now. I'm, I'm very fortunate to have a lot of mentors there. I came in as a complete hot shot, thought I knew it all because I was great at, at B2C sales and, and I was wrong. There's a lot of things I didn't know. What I didn't know is I could outwork everybody, but I had to learn what, what was different is, so you, you don't really have leads, you have accounts, right? And then you have some names of maybe people know that you know your company. I mean, we're the largest in one of the product uh, services we sell, which is talent solutions, but in some other areas, we're not the largest. And so while we have a great, great brand, a lot of people, they don't, they may not know me, right? And so the biggest, the first thing, Rory, to answer your question that I noticed is there was a transition sometime between like 2008 to 2010 where, you know, I I really started, I had to start out in like an inside sales recruiting role. And then I had to move into an account executive role outside sales. And I noticed that 
the, like just calling people at their desk phones just didn't work as often. And my message was just very vanilla. You know, so I would say, hey, this is Eric Fisher. I'm calling from XYZ Company. Their, their purpose on my call is we sell staffing solutions and I'd like to, you know, talk to you about, you know, we, we solve, you know, problems with your IT talent. And that worked for a while. But then what happened, I noticed is that nobody would return my phone calls. And that's because, well, everybody else is saying the same thing. And so what I started noticing is one, I practiced immensely, like to the point where I would sit in my bed and I would just be on LinkedIn and I would build call lists days in advance so that I could just be in execution mode. I knew I had notes next to every single prospect I was going to call because I did research on them the night before, the week before. So I always had, what was their background? Where did they come from? How long have they been at the company? Um, if it was a larger territory at that time where I didn't have, you know, huge name brand customers that I had developed, they're maybe mid-market. I had to do a lot of research on each individual company. So I had what I learned to do is build a very specific message or what I call the data is the intelligence. I would basically investigate these people very quickly, but in a way that I could craft a message that nobody else had. And the message was always tied to what the problems that people in their industry have and how we help solve that problem. And what I noticed was that prospecting is only one part of sales. I just believe it's the most important part. Um, a lot of sales coaches, you know, more specifically in B2C, focus on closing and all that. When you're doing B2B sales, and you're really good at it, especially at an enterprise level, there really isn't a lot of, there's no closing. Like you've done all the work. There's a lot of mini micro closes along the way, right? Gaining micro commitments from people. Hey, can you bring your boss to the table? Hey, can you bring these three other decision makers? Hey, can you connect me with procurement? Hey, can you introduce me to this other person in your organization? Like those type of things. But really it's problem solving. It's can you identify a problem and the persuasiveness comes into in storytelling and connecting problems and solutions and helping articulate things in a manner where people really understand, oh yeah, that makes sense. Or yeah, I thought that I, I had a preconceived notion about what it is that your company does, but that's just because I've been conditioned to think that, but oh, that's actually not, you, you can do a whole lot more for us. And that's what like really started opening up doors for me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like this is what everybody needs to be doing. And our company was teaching a lot of this because this method is taught. There are other sales trainers that teach a very similar approach. I just do it in a way that I think you can do it really fast. And I always think I'm just a super average person. I'm not very intelligent. I'm just average. And so it's like, if I can do it, anybody can do this. And I fully believe that when you do the right things and you practice them over and over, that whole phrase, whatever it is, success is when hard work meets preparation or whatever it is. I believe that as long as you're doing it the right way. Wow. Yeah. Would you say that it's taken a while to build up your confidence to get to this level or have you always just had like an outgoing personality? I'm still very insecure in a lot of ways, actually. My insecurity drives my thirst for knowledge, I would say. You know, there's this Clubhouse app. Are you guys aware of it? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah it's, you know, it's amazing. I, I, this, this app is, inc- and there's going to be one for video, of course, um, at some point. It, it's amazing. I mean, I basically get to sit on these masterminds with people that are, you know, running eight and nine figure businesses. It's incredible for free. But the one thing, you know, Myron Golden, I, I was on a, one of the rooms he was on the other day and he, you know, he's, he's a very confident man, what, very well spoken. And he said that ultimate confidence comes because you, you don't trust yourself. And so I thought a lot about that. I'm like, do I trust myself? A lot of people think I'm confident. They think sometimes I'm intimidating, but I'm actually, I have a lot of insecurities just like everybody else. It's just, and when it comes to sales, I just study it all day long and like human behavior and like how people react to situations and why they react and and then business, like why is business happening this way at this company or in this industry that those things I'm very confident about. But what I would say I've had to learn probably more so is I, a lot of times I seem very sure of things. And what I think one of my biggest growth opportunities over the last couple of years, and I'm not there yet, is being less sure. So having more of an approach of having more sureness that I'm probably wrong about something. And that kind of has led me into feeling more secure because it's, it's definitely okay with being wrong. We all know that. Everybody that's studied you know, self-improvement knows it's okay to be wrong. But leading a conversation where you don't seem so sure of your position and hey, you know what, there's probably information I don't have that I haven't collected yet. So what that leads me to do is, and, and I wish I need to get better at this in my personal life and my marriage, is asking more questions. 
Um, I, I'm really good at that in business is being less sure and asking more questions to truly try to understand, like, do I have all the information to be really sure about a statement I'm going to make? Because when you have all the information, you can ask great questions and that's where you can really start being persuasive. And you're being persuasive for the right reasons as long as you're convicted that your product or service will help your customer. Hmm. Hmm. So, so foundationally, so foundationally, you're, you're saying like research is one of the biggest uh, factors for uh, the sales process. Yeah, um, it, it is. But the, the thing is, is that so there's a sales trainer. He's probably the most followed sales and sales B two B sales influencer in the probably maybe in the world right now, but definitely in, in corporate. I would say for for individuals and businesses, John Barros. Um, I write about him in my book. There's a lot of other really good sales authors, but John John has a similar approach, right? Of like you have to call with a purpose. You have to lead with a purpose, right? And and so he's partnered with you know Gong.io and. Um, like I, I leverage, you know, Zant.ai and in my book as um, I cite them a few times, but it's leading with like, what does the data tell us is the best way to get in front of customers. But the thing is you can't spend all day researching. So what a lot of reps do is they have such fear of the phone that they never pick up the phone. So in today's world, you really have to have cell phones in a lot of ways. Like you, get, you can call a desk line, um, you know, there's all these services, there's Zoom info, there's all these different, you know, seamless.ai that'll provide you phone numbers. But if you don't have those, you got to send emails, but you certainly will never get anywhere if you spend all day researching and send five emails, like you'll never hit a goal. So it's how do you do really fast research and then take that information, catalog it somewhere. And then really what, what comes down to is once you start collecting wins and you start making sales or your company's making sales, it's collecting those stories and taking those stories and leading with a purpose, you know, it's kind of like a hook content. Right. So would you say that's one of the biggest mistakes you see sales people making? Yeah. Like if I were to walk in, even to my own company, you know, I, I, I love mentoring newer salespeople because I get a lot of fulfillment out of seeing them hit their goals. And almost entirely, if I walk in, I'll say, hey, what's, what's this company? How do they make money? Hmm. And if they can't answer that question, I'm like, oh my God. Like, you know, and it's, it's not like that they're dumb. It's just like, I mean, I've done that before. It's like, how do they make money? Like, what is their business? If you can't even answer that question, you have no business even calling them. So yeah, I think that's the number one thing. You're never going to have all the information, but you got to have enough. And really what I what I like to say is, is it's in sales, there's a line, right? So it's like, if you look at sales and a lot of businesses, they use athletes as a reference point, right? So you'll say, okay, what is it that the top 1% do? Well, the top 1% are experts. There's a book called The Trusted Advisor, which I love. I've read it like five times. And when you, in today's day and age in B2B sales, you have to be an expert in what you sell. Hmm. You cannot be a generalist. Like they, these big companies don't need generalists. Right. They need the best. They need the best. And as a salesperson, it is your responsibility to be an expert. And what does an expert mean? It's like, well, I'm not an expert in IT. I know enough about IT because I study it enough that I can ask really great questions. And I know the questions like why I'm asking them because I know the outcome that they're tied to. That is the biggest mistake. And so what the top 1% do is like, if you look at athletes beyond genetic ability, they train harder, they lift weights more, they work on their conditioning more, they study playbooks more, they do all these other things, they stay out of trouble. I mean, they do all these things that the other 99% doesn't do. And um, sales is the same. It's like, but what's nice is that in sales, if you can do a lot of the fundamentals, right, which takes, yeah, it takes a little bit of extra work, might take a couple extra hours, you create create the separation. And, and I don't ever talk about this in the book, but I, it's kind of like a separation effect. Like I know when I'm going into an account, I've got a level of separation against all my competition that I just naturally am going to have. And I create that separation. And then while you continue to use these methods and use storytelling and relationship building, you continue to build that separation. And then what I do is I look at the people that are better than me and I'm like, what's the separation effect that they have on me? And usually, and, and a lot of times they're not direct competitors. There might even be companies we partner with that are, and I, they have an account executive that it's better than I am. And usually what the leading indicator is, they're even more of an expert than I am in their product or service. People trust them. Exactly. Yeah. Now you mentioned that you enjoy mentoring sales professionals, when, especially when they're first getting started out. So what do you think is the best thing that they should do first when they're getting started? Just get started. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first thing is just get started. Too much waiting around you have to kind of, you know, skin your knees up and, and all that. Rory, as you know, there's a, there's a young lady I talk about in my book that is a personal friend of mine. We battle, you know, if, if she watches this, she'll laugh, but we battle all the time because we, we share some talents in business together and, and there's some crossover in our product lines. But 
I have a tremendous amount of respect for her because she came in with no, no college degree. She worked at a retail store, which isn't really sales, but I, I know she was good. Like she got recommended. She got her job because she came in and like basically beat down the door to make our old boss hire her. Said, I want an interview and like, like made him interview her. Um, Persistence. <laughs> yeah, she's just, she's persistent as hell. And she didn't know what she was doing when she was in inside sales. And, and then when she got to outside sales, same thing, like she just didn't really know what she was doing. All she knew is she needed to keep going. And so while you do need to do your research, you do need to model the behaviors of the people that are better than you, which she does. Now she's one of the best because her persistence and just like she skinned her knees so many times that the repetitions just led to continue. And that's like no different than anything else, right? Like I'm trying to learn like all these like different marketing things and all the stuff that I didn't learn growing up in, in sales. And it's a lot. I skin my knees a lot because I don't know what I'm doing and I just learn through mistakes. Right. We talk right. about that a lot. <laughs> and, but right. to your credit, you're smart enough to know that you don't know what you don't know about it. And then you find people who do and learn from them or have them help you, right? Yes. 100%. And I think like with the, this business, that's the nice thing, you know, that sales has afforded me is the assets to be able to hire people that know more than I do to be able to build the business faster. Because, you know, I run basically a, a 12 to $15 million a year business every single year. And it's a lot. Um, I have a lot of responsibility. I've got a family. I've got two kids. I'm married. I'm stressed out to the gills, just like every, a lot of people are all day long. And I could have never gotten this business even to where it's at today without hiring people that know more than I do. Mm -hmm. And I spend a lot on coaching because like there's things I just don't know how to do. And it's like, well, I'm going to go hire somebody that does so they can teach me how to do it. Well, and, and I want to put that in, into perspective as well, because you, you mentioned, you know, advocating for dealing with special needs on a daily basis with your family, correct? Yeah. So my son, uh, our son, uh, my wife and I have a son and a daughter. Our son, uh, Lucas, has Down syndrome. He's a terrific boy and I'm super thankful that we have him. You know, it's, he's not what we expected. It was very scary because, you know, nobody plans to have a, a child with special needs because you want him to have the best life they can have. But he's going to, he has a great life. He's going to continue. You know, he has challenges that other people don't have. But I think every parent with special, a special needs child or someone with special needs in their family knows this is it teaches you so much more about yourself and about life than you could ever teach your child because they just don't care about the same things that other people care about. Um, it makes you more empathetic, more understanding. It makes you slow down. I mean, I, you know, he screams and has, like I was telling you earlier, has tantrums just like, a, you know, he's four, but he has tantrums just like any typical kid. But there are things sometimes where he can't communicate what he's feeling. And so that's just made me, um, sometimes I get mad, just like I get mad at our, our six-year-old daughter. Um, sometimes I raise my voice, but, you know, my wife always tells me, I'm like, you know, I, 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 get, I yell sometimes. And she's like, you know, you need to stop yelling. And, and that's the one thing with him is he's yelling because he doesn't know how to communicate or can't communicate his thoughts yet to the level he wants to. And so it frustrates him. And so it, it helps me become, I think, a better, definitely a better person, but a better business person. Because a lot of times when you're in business to business sales, there's a lot of, there's a lot of frustration with customers internally and sales teams. People get emotional. They say things they don't mean. Worth rejection in sales is something that's taught me is like people don't, like they're not, I read about this in the book. It's not personal. Like they don't even know you. Like you're just, it's, you got to remember you're bugging them. You're asking them for their time or they're not getting back to you when you need to, when your boss is beating, you know, down your, your door asking, wanting answers on a deal. And it's like, look, they got other stuff going on. Right. So you got to find another way to get their attention and it better be about them and not about you. So not to like, you know, take my son and, and turn it into a business thing, but he's definitely helped me out in business. And I like to talk about him a lot because he's awesome. So, you know, <laughs> you know, that's, that's cool too. And my daughter, Olivia, she's fantastic. She's the best sister that, you know, and she's a great daughter too. So, you know, he gets a lot of attention. So it's also helps, helps us remember like big sissy needs some attention too. Yeah, absolutely. What's your, yeah. what's your son's name? If I may ask Lucas, Lucas. Okay. Lucas. Oh, yeah. Lucas and Olivia. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> too cute. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks for asking. Yeah. There's something I wanted to circle back around uh, on, if I may, you had touched on just briefly about micro-closing, but I want to ask if you could go into that a little bit more, like what is micro-closing for our listeners who don't know and why is it so important? Micro-closing or micro-commitments. So as I said, like what you really want to prevent in, in every situation, you have to ask for business, okay? So like the idea of there is no closing in sales. That's, that's not true in business to business sales. That's not true. It's just never a 
hard salesy close. You know, I, I had a deal that I won uh, that I've been working for a year. A lot of travel to win this deal. It wasn't even that big. I mean, but it was, it, it, it meant something because it, we had made a lot of progress with this particular customer. I loved the customer. Like I really, um, you know, became really fond of them and I knew it was a problem we could help solve. But I remember the customer saying to me, he made some comment and I'm like, so what does that mean? Like, are, so like you're moving forward with us, right? And he's like, oh yeah. And I'm like, why don't you just say that? <laughs> you know, so I had to ask him, like, did we win the, did we win the business? Right. You know, cause a lot of times what they teach you in sales is, well, Hey, you know, sign this contract right here. That doesn't happen in enterprise sales. There's no like, well, just sign this contract. I'll slide it right over it on your desk, especially right now. Right. Because everything's PDF and we're all virtual. So right. um, I mean, you can send someone a, uh, you know, a, a PDF document and say, here, just sign this contract. But that's not how this happens. These companies have procurement systems. There's processes you have to follow. So, the whole micro commitment thing is what you want to get to is you want to get your customer and this is part of, so in sales, there's prospecting, right? Which is like cold calling. There's warm, warm leads. Like I don't have any leads. I just have a CRM system and I have LinkedIn. Um, I don't, we don't have like a, a major lead generation system and, because we're big. And so we just don't have like leads coming in constantly is essentially my point. Some companies do, but there's, so there's, you know, some companies there's inbound sales, then they will pass it off to an account executive who will then meet with the customer. And then when you start meeting with the customer, you're doing qualification and discovery. Now, John Barrows talks about this a lot, that they really need to be separate because qualifying a customer is about you. You're qualifying saying, you know, hey, is Dominica or Rory, are they, are they a fit for my business and my product or service? Are they my perfect customer? Are they a customer that I even wanna work with? Do they have budget? Are they the right size? Do they have a problem we can help solve? Do I sense that this customer is going to be difficult? Do they have influence? Do they have authority? Can they sign a contract? There's all these things. That's qualification, right? What's your buying process? You know, all those things. Discovery is about your customer. So discovery is, you know, trying to understand what their problems are, what their pains are. And so micro commitments is right out of the gates from the first time you talk to the person or you send them an email, you want to get a small commitment out of them. And because what happens is, is that most salespeople don't do that. And so our customers, prospects, clients, whatever you want to phrase you want to give them or uh, title you want to give them, um, they're conditioned to not commit to things. So you have to get them to commit. So, you know, you'll hear things like some of the general th- ideas you'll have is you never leave a meeting without getting a next step. Never. Right. So if we leave this podcast right now and say this was a Zoom call with a customer, what's the next step? Right. And now how you ask about that, how you ask that question, there's a right and wrong way to do that. Right. You can be very, you can ask them an illumination question. Hey, what sounds like the the most logical next step for you? That doesn't sound very pressure filled. Right. But if you're saying, Hey, the next, or, or you could say, Hey, the next step that most of our customers take is we go into this. You could say that, right. That might seem a little more aggressive or, Hey, the next step is we got to do this. It's like, well, I'm not sure if I'm ready for that yet. Right. So you can start, start putting your customer in a situation where they feel like they're in the driver's seat but you're help ushering them along and you gain continually gain their commitment. And what that does is it builds and reinforces habits that they do need to commit to the, to the deal. They have to commit to giving you information. They have to commit to bringing other people into conversation. And the reason you do all these things is because one, um, it builds for a better customer outcome Two, it helps you close faster. So you can close a deal faster because what hangs up most deals is you're either not talking to the right decision maker. You don't have the, you don't have enough information usually. Um, and so when you can get them to start committing to all these things and following through on it, it leads to like, literally there is no close. It's just like, it's just a natural part of the process. Like you, they just do business with you. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And just the little language, just the little language tweak, it can be so powerful and get you the result you're looking for too, without sounding super pushy or aggressive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, um, that was one of the things I really loved uh, about working on your book is just how much sales language you actually put into the book to give people. Mm. Um, and I know you have so much more um, in your, your programs as well. Uh, but it's just, it's so vital to have that right languaging and the right mindset around why that languaging works or doesn't work. 
And so we'll, we'll definitely put a link for people to get your book in, in the show notes as well. One of the questions I also wanted to ask is, um, what are the current trends in sales management and, and what do you think could be improved with sales management? I think it depends on the industry. So again, like in my business, I've, I've run, um, I think what part of what makes me, why I feel I'm very qualified, I feel to help other people is I run a full sales cycle, right? So I've never been in a situation where someone's handing me leads, right? So again, nothing wrong with that. That business that, that exists in tons of businesses. They have inside salespeople that book the meetings, their appointment setters, which is again, really, really hard. Um, but a lot of times it's through a lead generation tool, right? Um, where they're downloading a white paper or whatever, you know, to opt in to give an email address or a phone number, um, or they're scraping data. But I think that sales managers get measured on how much their teams produce. And so the problem is, is that you've got high producers and then you've got usually, you know, you got high, medium and low producers, right? The low people, you can easily get them out. The middle people are the hard ones you can't get out. So how do you get those people either up or out? The issue is that I see is that currently there hasn't been a whole lot that's changed, unfortunately. And so there's all these new sales management books out. I do think like Mike Weinberg, Mike Weinberg has a great book out, Sales Management Simplified, that covers some more modern day ways to to be a a great sales manager. But when you lead people to, when you lead people and you, you focus on attaching themselves to the outcome, it leads to poor behaviors. So what I mean by that is if all you're ever measuring is their activity, right? There's a belief, more activity, more activity, more activity. That exists across all sales organizations. The reason for that is because we know that generally more volume of sales activity leads to more results, as long as the activity is quality activity. So there has to be a balance of the right activity, um, the right quality, quality activity, versus just bad activity, right? If somebody makes a thousand calls and every call and email they send is junk, would you rather have that person or the person that can make 25 calls and book 15 meetings and whatever, right? So I think the biggest thing in, in sales management that's current is there is more pressure to grow for most organizations. There's increased tools and software that I think we're over reliant upon um, to track behaviors and performance. And while tools can be great, those tools didn't exist for a lot of people that were selling 15 years ago, 20 years ago. So we figured it out the good old old fashioned way, which was, you know, I don't even know if I remember if there was LinkedIn in 2008 or not. Um, I could have to look that up. I think there was, but I remember when Facebook started cause I'm the same age as Mark Zuckerberg, but I, I, I know that, uh, you know, there was when there's no lead source, it's just you figure out how to get it done. And it's like, yes, I have to make a lot of calls. But through time, I realized I have to balance the right activity uh, with the right quality. And I think if sales managers can instill that, that let's do the right things. What I'm going to measure you on, though, is um, not just output, but also not just closed sales. But I think we also need to like almost shift our minds in terms of like what's expected of a sales rep in the first year. And I don't know that I have the right solution for this because it's, here's the problem with this. If I go hire five salespeople to be on my sales team right now, I'm going to expect them to drive results right now. I, I don't have a year to run a business and wait for you to eventually produce. So I understand that side. I manage, I've, I've managed and led salespeople. I've been measured by their performance, not just my own. The problem is, is that when you measure them and focus on you know the now, that leads to the wrong behaviors. So they get very focused on trying to close a deal and, hey, how can I, be, they, they, they basically become very transactional. I believe is that, you know, I think the argument people would make is, well, you got to learn how to, you know, walk, before, you know, crawl before you walk, before you can run. And in some cases, you just have to get repetitions in. And I believe that. However, I've seen reps where they get so focused on, well, I have to hit this number. I have to hit this number. They never focus on the long game. They never focus on, okay, well, that person's just not a buyer right now. Like they're not in, you're, they're, where they're at in their business cycle, they're not a customer for you. But if we're thinking, this is where follow-up comes in. If we're thinking of, well, that, co- that person is eventually going to become a customer. And the thing is, is like, that's, all, like I, I, that's always been my methodology is that person will eventually likely become my customer because when I qualified them, they have all the traits to become a buyer. They just aren't a buyer right now, but I could identify them as someone that would do business with us or with me. And so I stuck with it and I maintained and built that relationship, added value, provide information, um, 
help them introduce them to people they don't know, things like that. And over time, all of a sudden it's like, well, how did you land that deal? It's like, well, I've been working with that customer for two and a half years. Well, guess what? That had nothing to do with, you know, like a, a lot of times like we're like, well, what is our, uh, every sales organization has, um, you know, planning, right. For their, their annual sales forecasts. I think forecasts are a joke. Um, you have to have them, but they're quite frankly a joke. And, I don't think that any business is a joke for doing them. It's a joke only because, and I don't mean that in a disrespectful way, because if I'm running my own business, I'm going to still have people forecast, right? The joke becomes, it's your best guess. So many things could happen that are so much out of our control. That's why I think it's kind of a joke. So Especially we're going to take- now, right? Especially yeah, with COVID. <laughs> right, right. You know, so- you know, we knew that, right. That everything had decimated. And that's why like our, the company I work for is a brilliant, we have brilliant leaders. They reforecast, right. But every company has forecasts. And I just think that it's, it's a little bit of a joke because it's like, well, you're asking people to look through their crystal ball and you're basically saying what's in your pipeline today. The question we should be asking quite frankly is what are you going to close a year to a year and a half from now? Because that's how long relationships a lot of times take. And then I would say, Anything that happens in periods, and again, every business is different, right? You have businesses that are more transactional than others. If you're selling, you know, it doesn't, I give a million different examples, but if you're selling something that's more transactional, yeah, your sales cycles are going to be different. You're going to get more wins. And you might be measuring, well, my positioning in the company is this. I know they have these initiatives. I'm on, I'm on pace to sell these deals. But what about the deals that you got because you were focused on a customer for two years? Like, do those not count anymore? How do you measure those in a, in a period of time? Um, you can't. Again, I think it's like there are deals I'm closing today that I've been working for a year and a half and they go on, they go in my forecast for this year. But I think again, because of where I'm at in my career, I can focus on the strategic versus the tactical. The tactical just happens naturally. And so point being, my entire belief is you just build the pipeline, you build the pipeline, you build the pipeline, you build the pipeline, and then you do all these other things right in your sales cycle. Um, around qualification and discovery and positioning and anchoring against the things they need to do. And the deals just happen. Like, it's just, you don't worry about, well, what am I going to close this deal this quarter or, the, or third? I don't ever worry about that. Like if, I, if I'm doing all the work the whole time, why would I ever worry about that? Cause there's so many things I can't control. Um, but at the end of the day, sales leaders just want visibility because it's what they're measured on. It's their job. Their job is to drive results through their sales team. So that's the biggest thing is I think measuring people against time is hard. Um, I've got a really, I've got really good leaders that don't really do that. Um, so it's not so much of a problem in my company, but I see it or, or for me and, and my leaders, but I see it um, in other organizations um, and it leads to bad behavior. All right. And this goes back to an episode we, we did called uh, relationships, not transactionships. And it, it's just so important that you're just re-emphasizing what we, what we mentioned in that episode is that if you build the relationships, then you get the business and everything just kind of falls into place. It's, it's very uh, clear and easy process. Uh, your sales just kind of naturally happen as part of approaching it like that. When you try and hard close, it make it puts people on the spot to either say yes or no, and if they're not ready, then the deal's done, and you lose that relationship that you've built. Yeah, and I think I would agree with you. I think that the one thing caveat to that is you need this is goes back to becoming an expert, though, right? If you know, so I talk about this um, in some of my uh, Instagram stories and stuff like that, and you know, Daniel Pink talks about this in um, his master class, and he talks about it, I believe, in. Um, not in drive, which is, you know, to, to sell as human. I think it's in um, those other books. I forget the name of it, but uh, it's, it's information asymmetry. Mm. So um, have you guys heard of that before? I have actually. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all it means is you're, the other person has more information than you have. So this is very different than sales years ago, right? Because there's no internet. Now, our customers have more information generally, especially in business to business sales. Usually the person we're selling to a lot of times knows more than we do, which makes it really, really challenging. So everything you said about relationships, 100% true. People buy from people they like, but they will probably not buy from you if they don't trust you that you know what you're doing. The other thing is that I think sometimes when I say that, hey, it's just, you know, you got to focus on the long term, right? And, and again, to preface, all of my leaders that I get to work for and partner with, they all fully believe the same thing. You know, it's just be, kind of becomes, this is a necessity to kind of know like 
based on what you know today, what's your best guess on what you're going to close? Um, so again, it's, it's just something that I think it happens too often in sales. And because we have to say like, if there is no sales, you have no business, right? We all can agree on that. Like if you don't, and, and so the way that I look at it is it's relationships. It's the intelligence I talk about. Um, it's that separation you create over time, right? That again is or differentiation, but you, you have to look at it as like, you're wearing them down. And what I mean by that is like, I always look at like, if you're dating somebody, right? Like they don't, may not show interest in you the first time. It might be the girl in class or it might be, you know, the person you work with, hopefully in some companies, hopefully not, uh, but that happens a lot, but you know, it, maybe it's a, a friend of a friend or whatever. It's this person that you're interested in, but they're not interested in you at first. And you have to ask them questions about themselves and you have to bring in interesting information maybe to make them interested in you because you have to be an interesting person usually to make for someone to be interested in you. And I just feel like over time you wear people down and in a good way. I don't mean in a bad way that you're, you're, you know, you're riding them to the point where they just, okay, I give up. It's more of a, it's like every conversation you're connecting another dot for them. Like there's like a neuro, another neuron in their brain that fires. Hey, I like Eric. Um, Eric brought me interesting information. You know what? Every time I talk to him, I feel like I can trust him more and more. Um, I don't have any money right now, but if I do have money, I know I'm going to spend it with Eric. And so where I'm always trying to get to and where I'd like, what I try to teach the people that I coach is that, you want to get to a point where there is no other person in their mind that even, there's no name that comes to their mind. It's you and you only. And it's hard to do that in, in enterprise sales because they have countless options. In a lot of cases, everybody's the same. Like everybody sells the same stuff or marginally, you know, small differences. So the only way you can differentiate yourself. And so it's like, it's not price. Sometimes it's price, but a lot of times it's like, do you have the best solution for their problem? Do they trust you? Do you have a relationship? What if the two products are the same? They have the same price. Well, then what are they going to, well, they might, the person's making the decision. If you have a relationship with them and they've known you for over a year, they might even be honest with you and say, Hey, if you don't lower your price, you're not going to win this deal. So it might come to come down to price, but you might not have that information if you don't have the relationship. So um, I don't know. There's just so many things that go into it, but I just think that all those things happen over a long period of time. And so for sales managers, They've got a difficult job. Um, you can't crack the whip on people. You've got you know younger generations of people that are in that get hired into sales, and they're not motivated by the same things that people that you know are older. And so that's challenging, right? I mean, if you're in your late 30s, early 40s, or, or older than that, it seems like we have a different work ethic than younger people. Um, and that's really challenging for salespeople. How do I mentor these people that they look at the world through a completely different lens? And I think the answer is show them how to be successful and then the rest happens. This has been very inspiring and encouraging I, I, for me, but also for people who are just getting started in sales, but also people mm. who have been in sales for years, right? Like yeah. take, take the pressure off yourself and just continue building those relationships. It's really, really awesome just to chat with you. So thank you. Yeah, <laughs> this has thank been you. super fun. Yeah. Great. Well, Eric, thank you so, so, so much. Um, Roy, is there any other questions that you wanted to ask before we, we wrap up? Well, uh, Eric, where can people find you and do you have any resources that you, uh, for our listeners? Yeah. So, um, you can find me on my sales coaching program. Um, you can find me at Eric, uh, Eric Fisher official, um, on Instagram or Facebook. I've also got a podcast, which is the B2B growth accelerator. I have some free, um, sales tools, um, that, um, you can actually grab uh, off my Instagram or my Facebook. There's a link tree and you can just grab them right out of that link. Yeah. It looks like you post that weekly, which is amazing. Yeah. That's yeah. an awesome, awesome resource. Thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. And for all of you listening, Eric is offering 50% off of his Intelligent Sales Secrets Academy, which is huge. So yes, for our listeners only. For our listeners yep. only. Yep. <laughs> so we will have a link to that in the show notes as well. Eric, is there any final thoughts or any any anything that you want our um our listeners to know? I am running a, um, a 21 day um, challenge. It's not expensive. It's $47, but really over 21 days, it's entirely focused on the sales prospecting uh, function. And so over those 21 days, we help people absolutely crush their quota through, you know, we spend seven days on building their strategy and like really understanding who their customers are that we focus on what their message is. And then uh, the, the next, the last seven days is on execution. Um, and putting everything they learned into play. So um, we're going to be uh, launching that challenge here uh, within the next month. Um, and I know like if people, you know, people can take advantage of that and it's see huge results right out of the gates and really it'll bleed into the rest of their success for 2021. Awesome. That sounds incredible. 
you know, for anybody that does listen to this, that is, is in sales, or maybe they're, you know, if, 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 you know, I repost this and, and share it and you're younger and you're, you're, or maybe you're in a sales job, you don't like where you work. A lot of people make excuses, right? So everybody knows that excuses are just, just that they're just excuses, but there are bad companies to work for. I love the company I work for. Um, I am beyond grateful, um, thankful. Um, I'm, I'm filled with gratitude. Um, I, it changed my life. And, and yes, I did a lot of the right things. Um, and I developed the right habits over time and I invested myself and I, and I do believe I do things that a lot of people don't do, but I also believe that a lot of people can be in the same position I'm in. And so what I would just say is if you're looking for a sales job in B2B sales or, or any job for that matter, but specifically salespeople, don't go read the things online. Um, I think that's a huge mistake that most people make. If you're looking for a great company to work for and to sell for, don't go to glassdoor.com. Don't go to Google. Don't go to, I mean, do not do that because the problem is, is that nobody posts anything on those websites that are happy. So like, like I've never posted one thing about the company I work for on Glassdoor because I love the company I work for. They're a fantastic company. I think we're one of the best companies. You, I mean, we, we are one of the best companies you can work for. We've been recognized by Forbes multiple times for that. But if you're looking for a company, why don't you look at people that have been at the company for a number of years and track those people down on LinkedIn, become a, be a salesperson, hunt them down, build a relationship and show interest in the company. Say, Hey, I just want to know what you've been at that company for seven, eight years. What do you, that's a long time. Why do you like working there so well or so much? It's one of the best questions, you, best things you could do for yourself. And if they're like, well, this is an amazing culture. The compensation is fantastic. It's like, okay, well, that's a company I'd like to work for. Um, I think that's a mistake though, is that when you get out of college or even if you're young, even if you've been in business for a while, you might go look at all these online reviews and it's like, it's the last place you should look because we all know this, right? Critics are the ones that post negative stuff. The people that are happy never post <laughs> anything good. It's true. <laughs> really super solid advice. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. And, and that just kind of fits into my idea of that like culture is top down with business and growth is bottom up mm -hmm. and um, you can get into a company and you can do everything right. But if the culture does not support you, then no matter what you do, you're, you're fighting almost a losing battle in most cases. 100%. That's a so huge thing. That's before you thing. even get started, start with you're doing your research on the companies that you want to work for and asking the right questions to find out if they are a, a company that's going to support you in the long term. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was easy. It was an easy, it was easy for me because if you look at my company that I work for, there are so many people that have been here 20 plus years. There's a reason why. Yeah. They take care of their people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's like a big thing to look at, right? Is longevity of the people who are working there. Yep. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank so you. So fun. Oh thanks for God. having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> All right. We'll see you in the next one, guys. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye.